Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey everybody, it's Jessa. I'm back for another episode of the Better Sex Podcast, and so glad you're here tuning in and checking it out. I uh, am talking today to Ari Tuckman, and He's a psychologist who's been working in the field of adult ADHD for like 20 years or more. And he's got a new book out about ADHD and how it intersects with relationships and especially with sex, which I think is just a fascinating topic. It's not something I would have thought to address if he hadn't reached out, so I'm glad he did because it makes a difference. And I hear about this from couples a lot, the frustrations that one partner will have with another with that kind of forgetfulness or the difficulty completing some of these tasks or staying on top of things. And of course it affects the relationship, but there are actually some specific ways that it can affect your sex life. So stay tuned and I hope you enjoy it. The Better Sex Podcast is brought to you by the Sex Without Stress online course. It's a course for couples to escape the cycle of disappointment, avoidance, and pressure in your sex life. So if you're in a pretty good relationship, there's a lot of love and goodwill, but sex is your struggle, this could be for you. You work in the privacy of your own home and at your own pace to create a sex life you can both look forward to. If you wanna learn more, go to sexwithoutstress.com slash program. So Ari, thank you so much for being on the show with me. It is my pleasure. I'm really psyched to be here. Yeah, this is a, it's a really interesting topic to me because when I think about ADHD, I mostly think about kids, right? Like that's that's the way I hear it in the news or talked about so much. And, and of course it doesn't just disappear when somebody turns 18, I suppose. No, not at all. I mean, that's the thing, you know, kids with ADHD become adults with ADHD. Yeah. So, you know, now what sort of fades away is if you have that really overt, hyperactivity, so that kind of Calvin and Hobbes, Dennis the Menace kind of hyperactivity, (laughs) that fades away. So it's less visibly obvious, but, you know, the inattentive symptoms of forgetfulness and poor time management and distractibility and losing things and, you know, all of that remains. So, you know, you can see how that shows up certainly in the workplace, but as we're going to talk about today, that also very much shows up in romantic relationships. Right, right. And what's, I mean, I don't know if there are stats about this, but it seems, I know I've heard some from clients, they don't even discover their ADD until adulthood, right? Like, it's not like this always gets picked up in kids, right? How common is it for people to be struggling with some of this stuff and either not realize, you know, not been diagnosed yet, or they're getting diagnoses as adults? Yeah, no. So as a society, we're doing a pretty good job diagnosing ADHD in kids. So our teachers, our pediatricians, our you know therapists who see kids know to look for it, so to speak. But you know, unless you're an adult who's like 25, right, or 30, maybe 35, you you might have been diagnosed as a kid. But if you're older than that, more likely is that you're getting diagnosed through your kids. In other words, this is, I kind of call uh. this the two for one diagnosis. <laughs> you know, kid gets diagnosed and then the parents go, oh, yeah, that light bulb goes familiar. off. <laughs> right. Ding. I was exactly the same way. Or you, from what I hear, were exactly the same way. So, yeah. So it's, you know, for the folks, adults who are a little bit older, they're tending to get diagnosed through their kids more likely and or maybe even through their grandkids so you know it's sort of it's always been there they've always had it but it's you know just now that they're putting the label the explanation of ADHD onto this long-standing behavior compared to whatever other explanations they used to use yeah okay so I mean you listed a couple of the ways this shows up but um, what does it look like for somebody to have ADD as an adult and then 
you know, in life in general? And how, how does that start to affect somebody's intimate life? So, you know, the the struggles of ADHD are, they've sort of, you know, like we said, it's lifelong. So if you're, you know, 40, it's showing up today in the same way that, you know, when in, you were in third grade, it showed up. But it shows up at work and it shows up at home and it shows up in this and it shows up in that. Now, you know, it how much it shows up depends somewhat on the sort of how interesting or intense or whatever the moment is. You know, so if you're doing something that's really interesting, it's easy to stay focused, perhaps. But oh, okay. if you're doing stuff that's a bit less interesting, stuff that is less of an immediate deadline, then, you know, folks with ADHD have a harder time kind of doing what they know, so to speak. So like, um, you know, I should really clean up the kitchen or my wife's going to be pretty pissed about it because like I know that's kind of a thing that's important to her. But before I do that, I'm just going to do this thing over here. I just need to check this real quick. And, you know, an hour of Facebook later, you know, you realize that your wife is yelling at you and that's who you realize, oh, my God, it's been an hour kind of thing. So, you know, so it becomes a situation where the partner with ADHD has trouble kind of like being the partner that they would like to be, so to speak, you know, like to be consistent and reliable. And, you know, the, I know we talked about this, you can count on me kind of a person. Mm -hmm. Um, But then because obviously in relationships, nothing happens in a vacuum, (laughs) the non ADHD partner also has trouble being the partner that they would want to be. And I've had, you know, plenty of non ADHD partners sort of talk about like, I cannot believe that this is who I've become. Like, this is not who I am. I'm not like an angry control freak. That's not really who I want to be. But like, God, how, how do I always find myself there? You know, so they wind up in this kind of power struggle. How do we tell this apart (laughs) from, I mean, you know, because I'm thinking this applies in so many relationships. Are all of these people ADHD? Because it also just sort of sounds like people that that aren't pulling their weight or aren't committed to a relationship or aren't um, stepping up. Like that happens too, right? Where it's not always ADHD. (laughs) What distinguishes somebody who's who's just kind of not doing what they maybe should in the relationship from somebody who's really got a problem like this. Yeah. And so I think that that's an excellent question. Like, look, people behave badly for lots of reasons. Right. And, you know, the difference is not to be too simplistic about it, but when somebody has ADHD and they say, yes, honey, I will do that. Right. In that moment, probably they're being honest. Like, yes, indeed, stack of Bibles. I swear, Your Honor, I do indeed have the intent to clean up the kitchen and then put away the groceries or whatever. So they mean it when they say it, but the trouble with ADHD, I sometimes say it's it's a disorder of actualizing good intentions. Mm. And, you know, that they have the intent to do it. They understand why their partner would want them to do it. They're committed to it. They understand what will play out if they don't do it. So, you know, it's not that they're socially unaware and don't realize they're not narcissistically selfish and feel like I, I don't feel like putting away the groceries, therefore I shall not do it. Right. Um, They're not lying. They're not being passive aggressive. They're not like, you know, so it's not these other explanations, which isn't to say that people with ADHD can't have all those other things (laughs) as well. Right. Cause like, and we are certainly all got our moments, but there's more of a genuine intent. And, you know, perhaps more kind of diagnostically specific, so to speak, is that someone with ADHD will do stuff like this where they themselves pay a price. Mm -hmm. So it's not just this thing of like, you know, they only forget to take out the garbage, meaning their partner always has to do it, but they're really good at remembering all the other things they care about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, they'll also forget other things that does not serve them well. Okay. You know, and that's the stuff where they're as angry at themselves as anybody else is. Right. You know, right. so they forget to take out um, the trash, but they also forgot to bring lunch for themselves. And then they didn't have any lunch today. Yeah. You know, so stuff like that. Okay. Um, yeah. That's a, that makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, I heard what you're saying too, if something's especially interesting I mean, that might get a little, a little tricky, right? Like, wow, you can really mm-hmm. focus when you're playing your video game or you're reading that book or you're working on your wood sure. project. <laughs> but uh, so there can be some variation in this. 
depending on how yeah, engaged. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it does indeed, folks with ADHD bring their best when it's interesting. And that's part of the sort of struggle of ADHD is, is bringing and sustaining attention when it's not very interesting. And of course, life involves many tasks, which are not very interesting in the moment, <laughs> but probably important, you right. know? So now where it gets a little bit more kind of complicated is the stuff that's much more subjective, you know? So certain things like if you eat a bunch of unhealthy food and don't exercise, objectively speaking, you're going to have more health problems. You know, you're more likely to have health problems. So that's a little bit, you know, like that just sort of is what it is. Now we can debate whether how motivating that is to us and whether we care enough to do something about it, right? But but then there's other stuff like just sort of the preferences that people have for how they live their life. And, you know, one person wants the house in this kind of a way and the other person wants it in that kind of a way, or how do we handle bills? Or, you know, what do we do with the kids? And, you know, so stuff like that. So kind of the example I, I sometimes use is when it comes to cleaning up the kitchen, for me, when there's when the dishwasher is full and you have extra dirty dishes, you put them at the end of the island. So when you empty the dishwasher, they're there to just chuck right into the dishwasher, right? Because to me, that makes sense. Right. For my wife, sometimes what she'll do is pile them into the sink so that she can wipe down the island and not have to look at a pile of dirty dishes until, right? Now, that makes sense also, except when I'm trying to wash pots and then there's a bunch <laughs> of stuff, right? So like, here's the thing. None of this is right or wrong. Yeah, like, exactly. It's, really, exactly. It's, it's not. It's pure preference and, and, you know, subjective whatever, right? Right. But of course, often when we get hung up in, in relationships, we're fighting about these, these matters of preference and opinion. Yeah. And part of what happens is that folks with ADHD, there's this kind of joke that those with attention deficit end up with those with attention excess. <laughs> um, yeah. And it certainly shows up in my office. And maybe it, the reason why it shows up is because those who marry otherwise, you know, are happy and they don't show up in my office. But, but when you have someone who, let's just say, has particular ideas about how things should be, and they marry someone who is less consistent and reliable about doing it in that particular way, then it gets into this power struggle right. of one person wants things one way, the other person kind of prefers it another way, and then how do we negotiate those differences? And that's where it gets really kind of hairy and tangled up sometimes. And it sounds a little bit like somebody with ADHD is going to have a little more trouble doing it some other way. Like if it's more interesting or it makes more sense to put the dishes right. on the island, that it's going to just be that much harder for that person to sort of execute, <laughs> you know, putting them in yeah. the sink or whatever, right? Yeah. So even if they sort of say, you know what, honey, you are totally right. I will do this for you. I know you do a lot of stuff for me and you're generous and accommodating in other ways. So I promise from now on, this is the thing I'll do. Like they mean it in the moment. They're yeah, indeed yeah. being truthful. And maybe for the next couple of days, they do it. But then on the third day, they get sort of derailed onto something else or work takes too long or some other thing, they lose track of time and then dinner gets started late. Or it's just that, you know, consistency isn't there in the way that their partner certainly would hope it to be, but, but even in the way that they themselves hope it to be. And then, you know, you wind up in that kind of nagging, chasing sort of right. power struggle. Right. So, you know, so it's kind of like there's that old idea, maybe this is from David Schnarch, or I don't know if it's his originally, but kind of this idea that whoever wants something the least has all the power. <laughs> right, right. But it's, you know, and this sort of the add on I've, I've done with that is, you know, whoever wants it the least has all the power and also gets all the nagging. Yeah. yeah. You know, so yeah. it's this thing like the person who feels like the counter should get wiped down every day is going to be the one who's always going to feel like they got to chase their partner to do it because they don't really care or right. they don't think of it or they don't remember or other things come up or there's other priorities and they choose otherwise. So, you know, this is a universal struggle for every couple, right. but for couples where one person has ADHD, it just kind of exacerbates those universal struggles. Yeah. So I, I you know, it seems clear that this can cause relationship struggles, you know, power mm -hmm. struggles and resentment or um, frustration and things like that. But how else does this 
impact the sexual relationship for people. Like certainly yeah. if they're fighting or they're conflict, maybe, you know, that's going to show up in the bedroom, but right. how else is this relevant? Yeah. So I've written, I've written a number of books on ADHD. My newest one is called ADHD After Dark, Better Sex Life, Better Relationship. It's based on a survey I did. I had like 3000 people, which is a crazy number, um, <laughs> you know, fill out this far too long survey that I created. And I looked at all sorts of aspects of their relationship and their sex life. And what was really interesting was when I asked people to rate to what extent 25 different potential barriers to a better sex life, you know, are affecting their personal sex life. The least barriers were ones related to actually enjoying the sex once it happened. So usually once these folks actually got around to it, things were pretty good. Okay. The challenge, the biggest barriers clumped together into either not enough good feelings about each other for sex, right. which certainly fits. Um, yes. And, you know, if you're fighting about the kitchen, you're less likely to want to, you know, get to it later that night. Right. Um, or alternatively, they it fell into the not enough time or energy for sex. And, okay. you know, so... You know, if the partner with ADHD kind of, you know, they stay at work late because they're less efficient using time there. So the night starts a little bit later and then they get a bit distracted making dinner and then other stuff happens and then a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then it's just like you get to the end of the night and it's too late. It's like I, I'm too tired. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, you know, so mm -hmm. there's that sort of just the functional aspect that gets in the way, which again, just exacerbates any busy couple, you know, that's already a challenge sometimes to right. carve out and prioritize the time and energy for sex. But the ADHD inefficiency, it, it makes it even more, you know, more of a, of a, of a barrier to that time together. Yeah. Hey, it's Jessa. I'm just taking a little break to invite you to my free monthly webinars that I do on a variety of topics that always include an open Q&A session with me at the end. I'm doing these monthly. If you want to hear about them, be invited so you can register. Make sure you join my mailing list. You can go to bettersexpodcast.com slash list. Now, what was interesting though, so that's the sort of logistical aspects of it perhaps. What was really interesting in the survey is when I looked at, at all the questions that had anything to do with what I call sexual eagerness, meaning things like, what's your desired sexual frequency? So not what are you doing, but what would you like to do? Yeah. Um, Frequency of masturbation, of porn, how do you feel about your porn use, your partner's porn use, how kinky do you say you are, how long does it take you to get revved up or, in, you know, aroused or interested, you know, blah, blah, blah. I looked at, I asked them 12 different questions that had anything to do with sexual eagerness. The folks with ADHD taking gender into account rated themselves higher on 10 out of 12 and tied on the other two. Higher so, in levels of sexual eagerness. Yes. So huh. in other words, higher desired sexual frequency, higher masturbation frequency, higher self ratings of kinkiness, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I think that what it speaks to is that just as folks with ADHD tend to be more influenced by what's going on around them, including like distractions, for example, I think they're also more influenced by those random sexual thoughts or feelings that float through any of our minds and therefore kind of feel that sexual interest and perhaps get more caught up in the sexual moment than their non-ADHD partners do. Hmm. So when things are good in the relationship and we're all getting along and happy with each other, that's actually really important, especially in a long-term relationship, where, yeah. as we know, you know, that passion sometimes can fade, and it takes more intentional effort to keep the, those home fires burning. So, you know, that can be a real benefit to the couple to have someone in the couple who keeps that sexual interest, you know, high. Yeah. Um, 
that's the good news. The bad news is when, and you know, I think you know this well, given the work that you do, um, when one person wants it a lot and the other person not so much. <laughs> And right. that becomes its own, you know, kind of snake pit in a way right. uh, for couples. So how does this intersect with gender? Because, you know, is ADHD equally common in men and women? And so when you're getting this response from people, whether male or female, or um, yeah. the ADHD partner tends to have this eagerness? Yeah. So, and that's actually a really good point. In terms of what is the true gender split, Hard to say because what is definitely true is that there are still more men. Men are more likely to be diagnosed than women. But I think it's also because we don't think of it for women in the same way that we don't, you know, clinicians are more likely to think of ADHD when a guy walks through the door. Whereas with a woman who maybe is a bit anxious, maybe is a bit depressed, which is accurately diagnosed. But what is then not, then the clinician stops there and they don't look a little deeper and say, well, maybe the reason why she's anxious and depressed is because she's kind of disorganized, chronically overwhelmed, always feels like she's behind, doesn't manage time well. And that is driving the anxiety and depression. It's not that the anxiety and depression is driving the time management disorganization, mm -hmm. right? So like they see the pieces, but they, they, switch the direction of causation, if that makes sense. So, so women are more likely to kind of float under the radar in their ADHD is not accurately diagnosed, even though okay. it's sort of there. Um, so, but it does matter actually, which member of the couple has ADHD. And when the man has ADHD, they tend to have more struggles compared to when the woman does. Hmm. And I think partially it's because it exacerbates the existing sort of gender imbalance in the sense that in heterosexual couples, the woman still tends to be more the sort of coordinator and caretaker of the relationship. And if the guy is a, has a bit more trouble staying on track, a bit more trouble getting things done, checking boxes, and the woman is very much like, you know, oriented in that way in these couples, she winds up with more and more on her plate, feels resentful, and frankly, you know, having sex with her boyfriend or husband is like, I've, I had too much to do already. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah. Did you, have, did you get many thing. respondents when you were doing the survey and stuff from same sex couples to, to see how that shows up differently? Yeah. Or? You know, it's sort of, so when I created the survey, I did indeed make it open to same sex couples. Mm -hmm. And the problem was I just, I didn't get enough yeah. same sex respondents. So I really, it's like, I couldn't really do any meaningful analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I should also point out, maybe this is like a sex researcher nerd kind of, you know, trivia thing, but you know, the, the survey respondents that were in, in heterosexual relationships it merely specifies their relationship status. Now, some of them could have been bisexual. Some of them could have been, you know, closeted, but with a, you know, other sex partner. So, you know, um, there were people who are in non-monogamous relationships. So again, don't know the gender of the people they're with. Right. Um, there could certainly be people who are trans or otherwise gender non-binary. So, uh, you know, so it's kind of like, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag in terms of who's actually in the data, mm -hmm. but it, but I can't parse that out. Okay. All right. But people with ADHD are going to be, you know, more likely to feel that sexual eagerness or attached to those thoughts that go by or something like that and carry yeah. that flame. Okay. Which maybe exacerbates the issues around desire discrepancy. Is that sort of what you're saying? Like, you know, desire, <laughs> like I tell people all the time, desire discrepancy is universal. Um, right. doesn't have to be a struggle, but certainly is for a lot of couples. But in this case, an ADHD partner may make those struggles more difficult. Is that? Yeah. Well, so it, this, this breaks on gender lines in a okay. way that I think is really interesting. So when the man has ADHD, and I'm going to sort of paint the stereotype here, and obviously couples are different, but the stereotype in this case, at least in terms of who shows up in my office and complains about it, is you have the guy with ADHD has higher sexual eagerness. In general, overall, at the level of group averages, men tended to endorse more sexual eagerness. Now, are women not don't feel as free to endorse it, how much of it reflects the dynamics, dynamics of the relationship, like all of the above, yeah, but yeah. nonetheless. So you've kind of got this like 
horny ADHD guy who wants a bunch of sex and a tired, resentful, frustrated female partner who the last thing she wants to do is yeah. like, I'm dealing with enough of your crap. The last thing I need to do is be responsible for your orgasm as well. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, so that's sort of like, it's like a bad to worse kind of scenario. Yeah, yeah. Now, by contrast, when the woman has ADHD, they actually had sex about 25% more often than the couples where the guy has ADHD. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense in a way because men, again, endorse higher sexual eagerness. People with ADHD endorse higher sexual eagerness than non. So when you rank order the individuals, the men with ADHD rated the highest, their female partners with a without ADHD rated the lowest, but the two in the middle, the woman with ADHD and then the man without, were more similar. So yeah, they're yeah. inherently less of a discrepancy between okay. the desires, which is a shorter bridge to cross. Right, right. That makes sense. And maybe the relationship overall benefits from those positive feelings that come from those sexual encounters, which then spills forward in good ways in the relationship, which is kind of like part of the reason why I looked at the sex lives of these couples in the first place is, you know, like the bigger picture is if you're getting along better emotionally, sexually, and in those ways, you feel more connected than dealing with just the stupid, mundane annoyances of daily life is a lot easier to do as right, a team right. than it is when you feel like you're fighting each other. Right, right. Makes sense. So talk a little bit then about strategies, treatment, you know, getting diagnosed, like what it, you know, because it, it seems to me that if people are listening and, you know, recognize, uh, you know, recognizing this or this resembles their relationship, they're like, okay, well, so what do we do about this? What's the right? So, if you have a kid or genetic relative with ADHD, you absolutely need to pause for a moment, take a few seconds, and think, huh, does any of that sound familiar? Because there's strong genetics to this. You find one person in the family tree with ADHD, you probably find some others without looking too hard. And, you know, in terms of diagnosis, I'm not a proponent of humongous testing batteries, but a good interview that's at least 45 minutes, preferably a bit longer. Uh, maybe some rating scales is more than sufficient, you know, to really kind of identify is this ADHD or depression or all the above or whatever. Mm -hmm. In terms of treatment, you know, I'm a psychologist, I don't write prescriptions, but when it comes to stimulant medication for ADHD, I'm actually a really big fan. Okay. And the reason is, the medication that we have works generally pretty well. The stimulants are actually among the most effective in all of psychiatry. Hmm. Um, they're not addictive if you take them as you're supposed to. And there's a ton of research that speaks to the many ways at the level of group averages that folks with ADHD struggle more than those without particularly when untreated. So, right. you know, it's things like, it's not just things like, you know, lower grades and less likely to attend or graduate college, but it's things like lifetime earnings, car accidents. Yeah. Um, there's new research that speaks to life expectancy decreases wow. because of the way that ADHD affects, you know, health maintenance activities. So diet and exercise and, you know, compliance with other treatment options. So if you have diabetes, are you checking your sugar? Are you doing follow-up MRIs? Right, right. Are you, right? Like all those things that we need to do to keep ourselves healthy and around for the long haul. So although you may not love the idea of taking medication, I think we need to look at the other side of the equation, which is what if you don't take medication? What yeah. price do you pay then? Right. Right. Okay. So medication is... Uh, certainly to be considered. And then are there yeah. specific strategies that you work with couples around navigating these differences? I mean, I can't, I mean, I guess unless the difficulties disappeared as soon as you got on the meds. Right. Um, it seems to me you'd want to complement this maybe with some other kinds of approaches. I mean, absolutely. Educating yourself as the person with ADHD, but also the partner, you know, and then if it's, if you got a kid as the parents, you know, so there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's a ton of really good information about ADHD. So 
you know, see what those who came before you have come up with. And, you know, there's ways of kind of finding better strategies to get stuff done, better ways to stay on top of obligations, to get organized, et cetera, et cetera. So like definitely, definitely, um, you know, that's helpful, kind of good cognitive behavioral therapy in terms of like resilient mindsets and, you know, adapting to setbacks and all of that, because that's a part of life as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the rest of it as a couple is finding ways to negotiate the differences between you. It's not simply the person with ADHD needs to kind of get on board with what the non-ADHD partner wants, because that's not really sustainable. Right. Um, but neither should the partner without ADHD just sort of settle for whatever the right. partner Throw with ADHD. Right, throw up their hands and right. give up, right, yeah. Right, like, you know, so like happy relationships involve a sustainable balance where I'm getting what I want, you're getting what you want, and somehow we negotiate the differences. Yeah. So, you know, so there's definitely some good kind of couples work to be done there as well. And, you know, it, it again, it, it's not, creating new problems is just exacerbating the universal problems. Yeah. And, you know, if your sex life is important to you, then working on your relationship is a good way to improve your sex life. And if your relationship is important to you, then working on your sex life is a good way to get there because they overlap a lot. Yeah, they sure do. Uh, <laughs> yes, totally indeed. intertwined. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, that old chestnut of like, just help the couple get along better and then their sex life will magically fall into place like you know that not necessarily right so right. you know but it's one of those things where i think it's hard to have those really kind of personal intimate revealing sexual moments with someone that you've been arguing with a bunch all day right you know so like um but I think also those you know the powerful connection that happens in those sexual moments really has the ability to, to cast a long shadow on what happens afterwards. So, yeah. you know, so again, they're totally intertwined and working on both is like, they're both important and they're both worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. So where can people find you, learn more about you, find your books, things like that? So best place is adultadhdbook.com. And I've got a bunch of stuff on there about my books, but also just, you know, like recordings of webinars and presentations and interviews and, you know, sample chapters and handouts and like all sorts of information about ADHD and links to other, you know, good stuff going on in the world of ADHD. So that's, that's definitely the best place, adultadhdbook.com. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much for doing this. And, uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Excellent. Sounds good. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advance access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family you can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.